now you're stuck. And you would have gotten that joke if you'd moved up closer, you would have heard her. Okay, that's good. Let us pray. Gracious God, with joy and thanksgiving, we gather as your people. We have come to hear again the timeless story of Christ's birth. The excitement of this night, quiet our hearts that we may know the peace and the fullness of this holy time. Shine, O light, in the darkness of our world. Sing, O angels, in the stillness of our hearts. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those God favors. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our opening hymn is Joy to the World, and you don't have to flip to uh, the hymn because I have that. I know, isn't it sweet? You do need to stand. Proclamation, Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may invite into our lives your Son, who you sent to us this night. Let's stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel is found in Luke 2, 1 through 7. And in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus, that all the world should be registered. This is the first registration that was to, taken while uh, Quintius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered, and Joseph also went to the town of Nazareth in, in Galilee and Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was a descendant from the house and the family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child and she gave birth to her firstborn and wrapped him in swaddling, or in swaddling cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the end. In the end, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Take your hymn, don't turn to hymn number 245, or watch it on the screen. <laughs> to give him credit, I was practicing reading in the dark, he didn't practice, it's hard.
receive. I haven't done this since I was at Milan, and so I didn't proofread as well. Sorry. You know the song. <laughs> think of people who have changed the world. You can go back to the first centuries. You can think of Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, uh, Genghis Khan, all the people who they, they don't need like another name. Which Alexander? Alexander the Great. Oh, that one. Uh, you can think of people in modern times. Churchill, uh, Lincoln, Roosevelt, if you think of people who have changed the world, what do they all have, many of them have in common? Government power, right? an army at their command, that tends to help. Right? Uh, funding, massive funding, the funding of a tax base, that, that tends to help as well. And, and that tends to be what, what we think of when we think of changing the world. We gather tonight because of the birth of someone that changed the world far more than any of these. And, and did he have any of those things? No. Did not. At his birth, there was not an army. Instead, there was one angel who had gone and talked to Mary and then talked to Joseph and said, it's going to be okay. Chill. Instead of a, a government support with all of its funding and structures and influence, there were a couple shepherds that showed up. And shepherds were not exactly the people you want knocking on your doors in the middle of the night. Uh, they were shepherds because they couldn't be trusted with any other job. So knock, 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 shepherds. Mm, right? Instead of well-rehearsed speeches gone by government officials, instead there was a crying child, an exhausted mother, and a frazzled dad who had not been able to find a uh, room for them to have a real room. Probably a little bit angry, too, because how angry would you be if you'd knocked on the door and your wife about to have a kid and there's not a single... I mean, chivalry was still a thousand years down the road, but there wasn't a single man, man in there who was going... And he, Joseph was probably all over the place, frazzled and angry at that point. Uh, so there's not a lot of, like, the standard trappings of power that we see here. Why, why is it that this is how God... Did it? Why in God's infinite wisdom did it go down like this? Well, you see what FDR, Truman, Roosevelt, Kahn, uh, what, what they did, they did with force. And as any parent knows, how far does force get you when it comes to disciplining children? Right? Force can stop the child from beating his sister, but it can't make, her, make him love her. Right? The force can stop but it cannot create. I can spank a child till he stops misbehaving, but I can't spank them until they love. I can't spank them into kindness. It doesn't work, right? F it just doesn't, doesn't work. I can tell you that, that force can stop people from hitting each other, but it cannot make them love them. It can force you to stop discriminating, but it cannot stop people from hating. The use of force, whether it's vast governmental force or whether it's the thou shalts and shalt nots of the law, the force can only do so much. It's a good start, but it's only a start. And this child shows up so that we can go far beyond just a good start. What this child came to do is to invite, to invite us to live differently and to pave the way for us to join him in the kingdom that he will proclaim. The child is born who will change the world, not by force, but by invitation and forgiveness and by service, right? It's an invitation by someone who is, I mean, born amongst the lowest of the low, he can invite anyone to follow him. And it's an invitation, there's no force, right? Because you all know what happens when your boss invites you to do something, is it really an invitation? <laughs> yeah, my, the DS, my boss, invites me to come have coffee. It wasn't an invitation. This child is born in the lowest of lows that the invitation is true. It is honest. It is real. The other thing about this being a child, about the way that God works, is uh, the nature of being a child. How long does it take for a child to grow up? What do you say? Long time? 12 years? 18 years. I'm 37. Am I grown up yet? <laughs> 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 
I can fake it sometimes. <laughs> Facebook does this thing where it reminds me, it shows me pictures of the past, and um, it's amazing this combination of, of it, take, it seems like growing up takes forever. And then I look at Facebook, and it reminds me of a picture three or four years ago, and I look at them and go, wait a minute, when did that change? Right? You, know, you know that feeling, many of you. you. You look at it and like, at what point did it go from, I was changing diapers, I'm not changing diapers anymore, when did that change? Right? This is, there is something about accepting the invitation to follow Jesus that is like that. Like, it doesn't seem like that long ago that 20-year-old Andy was sitting in, at uh, the Wesley House at Truman, uh, an undergrad, wondering, could I ever read the whole Bible? Do I believe it? Right? Am I willing to commit myself to it? I was, I was a cynical jerk in, in college, and, and I, I was about to make the decision, am I going to be a cynical jerk and atheist, or am I going to be a cynical jerk for Jesus? And that, where, what happened between now and then? That was 17 years ago. Where did that go? Yet in those 17 years that seemed to have passed like that, y'all look at, you're all looking at me like, like I know what I'm talking about. Right? That's what it's like to follow Jesus. If you look, in, look 20 years ago, look five years ago, it's like a child growing up. You don't realize what a difference it makes in your life following Jesus day by day, the act of praying and giving. You become ever more humble, ever more Christ-like, and you just, it just happens. I mean, I think there's something about following someone who's born as a child that, that captures that sense of it, it is just goes by in a blink of an eye, and yet day by day you're not quite sure, is anything changing? We come to get together tonight because a child is born and something new begins, and I'm thankful you're here to, to celebrate that with us. You are offered the same invitation that everyone is offered, the invitation to follow this child. You're not forced, you're invited with the confidence and the faith that as you follow this child, as we follow this child day by day, each day might not seem like it's doing much, that, but, but that day by day as we follow this child, you will become more graceful, more Christ-like, more humble, until you follow that, that child as he grows up into the king whose kingdom we seek. Amen. And I now invite you to join with me as we confess our faith, the faith in that child, that child who grew up in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Please stand and join me as we confess together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, in the life everlasting. Amen. We come to this time when we're going to have this confession in peace, and in such a small setting, it doesn't make sense to have a big old formal confession. We, we do, the, do the confession because the invitation to this table is that all who are invited to this table who love Jesus, and the fact you're here tonight, yippee, love Jesus, confess your sins and seek to live at peace with one another. And, and so that, that's what we do next. We confess and we create peace. And... Um, to confess is to say that even in the midst of the busyness, to have the moment of clarity to say that I'm not the pastor that this church deserves. I'm not. I'm not the husband that, that my wife deserves. I'm not the father that my children deserve. I seek to be better than I am, but I know that I fail. Is that true of all of us? Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. This proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Now let's create some peace. You are at peace with each other. You are together on this warm and beautiful night. This is a time to celebrate and create the family to be the church. So love on each other. Hug, handshake, kiss if you're related. <laughs> Thank you.
Now we are taking up an offering tonight. It is not an offering in the usual sense of the word. This is an, one, one of our last opportunities. Um, I've invited the church to contemplate giving the first gift of their Christmas to those who need water. There are many people around the world who don't have clean water and anything that goes in here will go to purchasing uh, their $50 filters that will provide clean water for one family for 10 years. And so uh, either during communion or after worship or next Sunday, uh, you are welcome to put something in here as your first gift of Christmas. Offering. And now... So when is the last time you had 10 to 12 to 14 folk in a room for, you may be seated, uh, sorry. When was the last time you had a whole bunch of people gathered around a table for a meal and everyone was serious the entire time and no one talked and everyone just looked at each other very serious like? Doesn't happen, does it? We come to communion at this time, and we tend to come to communion, and it tends to be way too serious. And um, it's a feast, right? The first, the first communion, uh, it's the last supper, but it's also the first communion. You get 12 guys together, 13 guys together, and, and you crack open bottles of wine. Everyone had four glasses of wine. That's the communion. For Passover, you have to drink four bottles of wine. How many is four bottles of wine? Or four cups of wine, which is one bottle. Like, a bottle per person. It's a good time. And so in the midst of this, yeah, a bottle a person, that's, that's a feast, isn't it? You're going to be there a while. So uh, it tells us that they reclined at the table. <laughs> there might be a good reason they reclined. <laughs> So they reclined at the table and they're having this feast and yes, it's tense and yes, there's a lot going on, but they're enjoying themselves. And in the middle of this, it's not like Jesus took bread and said, okay guys, everyone, stop it. Be serious now. No. Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And he said to them, "Take my, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And what he's doing is taking the meal that is a celebration of God's act of salvation for the people of Israel. And he's saying it's about to happen again. And isn't that an act and a moment of joy? And he takes the cup. This is cup three of four if you're doing a Passover. And he blesses it and he gives it to his disciples. And he says, take and drink all of you. This is, my, this is my blood poured out for you, the new covenant for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you eat this meal in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray your gifts upon this bread and upon this cup, that your spirit might move and they would be for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, that gathered together as his people, that this might be a time of joy, a time of celebration, a time of hope that captures the, the, the giggles and the, the noises of a newborn child and all that happens, all that hope captured when, when a family is gathered around a newborn. We pray for this in the name of your Son and our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. We pray that you might strengthen us through it and send us forth to be good news for the rest of the world. Amen. We're going to light some candles now. And the way this works is I'm going to take my candle, I'm going to come out here, and you're going to light yours off of it. And the, the candle that is lit stays up, and so that the candle that is being lit turns. This way we don't drip wax all over the place. <laughs> Is when we start. When do you light candles? Non rhetorical question, seriously. When do you light candles? Birthdays. Do you do it for Valentine's Day? Sometimes. You do it when people are coming over. You have guests coming, light a candle in their room, or put a sensi in there, because that's what we do now. That uh, candles are what we light when someone shows up that we care about deeply. And we want to mark that moment that matters. Because when someone, you walk in and someone's lit a candle for you, what's that tell you about how they think about you? You, you matter, right? And, and so I, I think it's perfect to light candles at this time to, to mark how much the birth of this child matters to us. And, and so... Um, we give thanks that Christ is born this night, and it's fitting we mark it. So please stand and join me as we sing three verses of Silent Night.
thing it's a hopeful thing and there's and there are just a few moments every once in a while that are like this where the child is quiet and you can enjoy the moment i hope you've enjoyed this moment before we go back into the craziness of christmas thank you for being with us this evening go forth and may the peace of christ be with you this day and always amen amen